Hello folks, welcome back to World War II TV. Bit of a cheat, it's not really live. This is me live, but the footage I took was from two weeks ago. When I was on the, in Vercor, uh, there are certain locations where I just had no mobile signal at all. This was one of them, so I have taken the footage, edited it a little bit, and I'm going to talk over it today. So, because when I was doing the live streams on vacation, I couldn't show any maps, I'm going to start with just a couple of maps to kind of orientate yourselves, and they are from the incredibly good... Uh, website that's linked below about the Vercor. It's mostly in French. Some of the pages are in English. What's fantastic about it is there's a massive great archive page with maps and videos. It's a little bit difficult to see. You have to kind of put in search terms and lots of it's in French, but they're, the great thing is they put them there available to use for everybody, you know, uh, hobbyists, historians. They're downloadable. They're in decent quality and and they're, they're free to use. So I'm going to start off with a couple of maps. So this one here, is a map of the Vercor. So you can see over to the, the left-hand side there, the green flat area around the valley of the, the, the river that's near Valence. And then over to the top right, you have Grenoble, which is the city I spent a, a last few days in. And then in the middle is this big plateau. And within the plateau is this, this um, valley. Uh, and that's where Vassier on Vercor is. And this is where the footage I have be showing you in a minute was taken. Um, and this area was absolutely ripe for resistance. This is a map also from the same website showing the number of Maquis camps or resistance camps that were in this area. I mean, it was a huge area. Now, as I said in some in the introduction video, a lot of these young men are here escaping their obligatory service for the German army. The, the, the Germans crank up in 1943 and thousands of young men sort of were, were hiding across France to avoid serving in Germany where there are hundreds of thousands of French workers, some of them the prisoners of war from 1940. So they start gathering in the Vercors because they thought it was it was safe because, you know, surrounded by mountains, didn't, did, Germans didn't go there very often. And these photos here, there's lots of them on this website uh, showing these resistance. And there were lots of airdrops to them. You can see these guys here have Bren guns. These guys here are, are this is the summer. So they're from across France. They're not just from the Vercors. They're from different, there are poles there as well. This one here shows them training with gammon bombs. So B-17s at one point flew over, dropping numerous equipment bundles. And in the museum, there's there's one of the uh, drop canisters that they drop weapons to them. Now, the interesting thing is, is that at no point were they ever dropped any heavy weapons beyond machine guns. They really requested mortars. They really requested um, light field guns because the idea was the French resistance Leaders there coming from places like Grenoble and Lyon wanted to use the Vercor as like a base to go and uh, uh, attack German columns moving to the front or in fact later on moving back from the front. And it was called the Mountain Plan. But for various reasons that I'm not going to go into, the French government in exile, the British, the SOE, did decided not to support the French resistance with big weapons. Maybe a fear of communism, maybe other things there. But they, the biggest weapons they got were a few bazookas and, I say, machine guns. They got some really interesting weapons as well, some Johnson M1941 uh, submachine guns, Sten guns. Uh, and they also dropped in some sort of Jedbra stroke, OSS stroke, SOE teams to train these resistance uh, fighters up. Um, so, so they had some reasonably good weapons, but nothing really heavy. Anyway, what I'm going to do now is I'm going to play the video now. It starts with silent, and there's a bit of it where I'm actually speaking on uh, there on location, which I'm leaving in because I think it's good to have my reactions when I was actually there. And then I will later on when it goes to uh, the, the other part of the video, I will carry on talking now. So I'm going to play the video, and I've got some more maps and things I'm going to show you later on. But uh, this is my time in the Vercor going to the Resistance Memorial, and that memorial museum is also linked in the description below. So I'm going to put the video up now. And um and 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 play it. So this is yeah me me kind of at the approach to it where there's talking about the uh, the museum and what you can see there. Then in a second, a few thirty seconds or so, it cuts to the me, the recording of me where I talk about my first impressions. So this um is the entrance. I don't know whether you can appreciate how damn hot it was there as well. It was about in centigrade, about 34, 35 degrees there. Um, so in the nineties. Um, so a bit hot. So this is me talking to you right live now. Then a few seconds, I'm going to stop and it cuts to the me, me of me talking there on location. I'll talk about my uh, my reaction. And good morning or afternoon, everybody, wherever you are in the world. So as we walk down here, I've been kind of reading about this battle for 
I don't know, three decades or something. You never can visualize the battlefield till you're there. So this is where we're going to. So I think I first became aware of this battlefield from the third series of Wish Me Luck, which was on in the 80s, about the SOE, Jane Asher. Julian Glover, who was <clears throat> the baddie in the third Indiana Jones Last Crusade movie, and various other people. And the third season, which was the weakest in terms of actors, I think, was the one that was shot on location here in Vercourt. And forgive me for talking about a TV series, but I rewatched the last couple of episodes well, about a week ago, and a lot more of it was st uh, filmed in the studio than I remember presumably because of the budget. <clears throat> but when they did have these momentary fleeting shots of the Vercor, it didn't really convey what I'm seeing now. So I think I said in my introduction video, Vercor, we're on a plateau already high up, but surrounded by another set of ridges. And on this plateau is where the resistance had been gathering and they kind of declared a free state in June after D-Day. And the thing about this plateau is, you can't see it from where we are, is there's only a few ways you can get in. We drove in kind of from the north, and you're going up a typical kind of windy, almost alpine road. And the resistance, when they started defending here, assumed that there's no way would the Germans come anyway from any direction other than these roads. And they defended the roads, there's one coming sort of south from Grenoble and various others. And what happened is the Germans, I'm giving you a very simple version here, A, they landed gliders in the middle of the plateau, I think it was about a dozen DF-20, 230s gliders, you know, nine glider-borne Faust Omega, and a few later came in with cargo. So gliders landed right in the middle of the plateau, in the village down the valley from where I'm walking you to. And then the Germans, using a reserve division of mountain troops, Gerber Jäger, forgive my pronunciation, used kind of four, not secret, but like donkey paths over the ridge and kind of took the resistance from behind it in a sense. And so the Germans outnumbered the resistance two to one anyway. And the fact they came in from the direction, well, they did also coming down the roads but they were sort of diversionary attacks when they came over the mountains it was the, the resistance couldn't deal with it basically So I'm going to pause it there. It's me talking again now, and I'm going to show you a couple of the maps there because uh, I obviously, obviously couldn't show. That was me talking live there now. This is me talking live now now, so real live as opposed to earlier live. So the the, the German glider. So I'm going to show you this map. And again, all these maps are on this brilliant website that is in the link below. So this is um, a map of the, of the German glider landings. Uh, sorry, no, that's not the right map. That's the overview map of the German attack. So you can see they're coming in south from Grenoble at the top there. They're coming in from the bottom, uh, the, uh, sorry, the north of Grenoble, the south at near D at the bottom. And then it has the name of the commander of each group. And Group Schaffer is coming in 
um, from, from the left-hand side, the map there. And basically, they're encircling it. This is the kind of method they had been using in a, in a couple of earlier instances in, in the spring of 1944 in France and also in Yugoslavia. Basically, the, the Germans would, would, would move around an area where there's a resistance uh, network and then block all the routes into it and then gradually kind of close the circle around the, uh, the, 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 the center. And that was the plan here. So that's the, the German plan. And then the, the actual plateau bit where I'm walking down to, the bit where I'm filming from is in, if you look at that map there, it's uh, uh, you see um, a Vassia on Vercors where the two arrows from Group Schaffer are converging. So I'm about where the I is in Vassia on Vercors, or actually I'm about where the U is in Vassia on Vercors. So I'm on the on the on the eastern ridge um, around this plateau there, and you can see behind me or be, to the to, be, to the right of that where it says Zone de Par. Par is the French for pass. There are these little kind of bridge symbols there. And that's where the Germans came in with the mountain troops over, over the top. And, and the, this is, next map is the glider landings. This is showing you where the gliders then. So again, Vassia is the village, at the bottom of the valley. The, the memorial building is about where it says 1059 meters there. That's where I am having, having parked above it and walking down to it. And you see they're coming in, flying from south to north. And interestingly, and rather tragically, when the French resistance who were in the plateau saw these aircraft, or rather heard the aircraft coming over, towing the, towing, towing the gliders and, and saw the gliders, they thought they were Allied gliders. They thought this was part of, of a, an Allied assault because they had been requesting report, uh, support from an Allied parachute division for, for ages. And, and um, uh, yeah, definitely, Ian, it was less, less successfully in Yugoslavia, although the, the Germans did have some, um, uh, some success there, but not 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 too much so so they thought these gliders were allied then they realized with horror that they had you know the, the black iron cross on the side and they were full of germans and as you know the the the, the, the 230 glider had an M, uh, mg08 i think it was on top there that the pilot could use on the ground so it's coming under machine gun fire nasty 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 so the gliders were the first big surprise and then the second big surprise so there's the but the overall um, German plan that they've been working on for six weeks. Remember, this area had declared its independence just after D-Day, and then the attack goes in on July the 21st. They had a good six or seven weeks to put this together. So that's the overall plan of coming in there. And then the actual passes, there's the map of the passes. So if you, again, if you look at to the left center of the map is Vassia on Vercor, which is where the memorial is, and you'll see there running north to south to the east, Pas de Barrière, Pas de la Ville, Pas de Chaton, Pas de la Selle, that's the route across the mountains the Germans used to, to um, encircle the resistance. And once they came in across these mountains and there are, they, they had machine gun fire from high down there, the fields of fire were great, the Germans have artillery, the Germans have cargo gliders coming in. Now, at one point, the resistance looked like they were able to deal with the gliders landing in a plateau. At one point, the Germans there was kind of surrounded, they were cut off, they couldn't get any supplies, and there was a kind of a, as there often is with these battles, there was like this tipping point moment where it maybe could have gone the French way and they could have eliminated the Germans who came in by gliders and, and, and maybe, maybe survive. What happened is, is that as the Germans kind of began to attack their way in and move closer and closer, they, they got linked up to, and the Germans came in. And once the, 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 the little kind of cut off German column uh, group in the center from the gliders were relieved by other Germans. It was it was never going to end in anything other than a German victory. And the Germans then just put more and more pressure from all these directions there. But that's kind of an overview about how the plan went in. Now I'm going to show you, this is having come out of the museum. And I'll do a kind of review of the museum in a minute because the way they set it up there is you have to go through the darkness to come out into the light. Now I couldn't film inside the museum because I wasn't allowed to, and it would have been inappropriate anyway. There were people there; I wouldn't want to get in their way. But and I will review it later on. But it takes you through the darkness of the German occupation, the deportations, the the, the rules that were imposed against the Jews, etc., etc., etc. And and it then moves you through to the Battle of Vercor, the the aftermath, the massacres, and then then there's a a final kind of area where. It's hard to describe, but they put the names of all the people who, in the resistance who were killed there, and they wrapped each name in like a lead, a, a lead sheet of lead, and they kind of fold them up and they put all these um these uh, uh wrapped up names on this wall. It's hard to describe. Maybe I can find my photo I took there and upload it while I'm talking to you. That would that would if I can do that. But 
And then you literally step out into the light. And the light is this view we're looking at now. And you come out with this amazing viewing platform. Um, and I'll just address Ian's question before I go there. Would the Germans have got assistance from uh, Vichy collaborators? Yes, they did. Uh, and the Melis as well. There are Melis, um, uh, so the, the, the French police who serve with the Germans. There had been a Melis attack into the Vercor or attack, a, a resistance quashing exercise i think it was in march 44 that wasn't very successful and some of the police were were, were were killed in this this rather hastily put together german operation and it gave the police a bit of an um an, an edge uh for when they came back again in july to kind of take things a bit more seriously but that as i said in the earlier video this morning the germans are going into this very very seriously they are they are taking no prisoners they are they are taking hostages they're burning farms they're burning buildings and Although some of the French who were assisting the Germans were willingly doing so, some of them are really cajoled into doing it under under threat. So there's a combination of actual Nazi supporting French who are assisting the Germans and other people who are literally trying to save their families' lives and giving information. So so that, but I'm gonna go back and I'll play this 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 clip. There's, there, it's just me talking now, and you can see I'll, I'll, I'll get rid of me so that you can see it more clearly. I mean, what an incredible view. I mean, I've seen some views in my time um, from battlefields, but this is looking out kind of um, to the south. So um, we're on the high ground. The Germans came from behind where I'm filming across the ridge behind me and then forced their way down, down in the uh, um, in the valleys where the gliders landed, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And there's, um, in a minute, the video takes you across the, um, the explanatory panels where they have uh the um the, the drawing of the location showing what things are so um yeah an incredible view uh, it was a bit hot there um but you know what an incredible view and and um they so at the to the right there is the village of bassia on the core which was completely raised to the ground by the germans there's i think like the two original buildings there there I, if you saw on my twitter account i posted the then and now in the in the there right in the center of the shop there and the resistance had been building also in the center of the shot there. If I'll pause it, so just the, the green, the green diamond-shaped field uh, just um, above the village there. That's where the resistance had been building and a landing strip, it was an, an, a, an improvised landing strip where they were requesting assistance by the Allies to bring in an airborne division with gliders, and um, and it was used. The, the plateau was used for, for drops of canisters, but but no resistance. Uh, so no Allied aircraft ever came in and used these airfields. There had been plans to build, I think, five airfields, and this mountain plan that was perhaps a little bit naive by the French was was never really properly used. But that's that's the. So I'm looking um, at that point now. I'm looking pretty much due due, uh, due west, and so this this little kind of long thin plateau is in the middle of this huge mountainous region and that, that that in the middle of the shot there is a road i drove up to get to the memorial where you can take these switchbacks zigzags and um incredibly beautiful as you're saying as you're seeing there uh, willie and troy i mean it, it, this is the, the my reaction sometimes at battlefields is that when they are naturally beautiful as this air location was and the majority of people who go there today are going for hiking and 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 um waterfalls and, and kind of outdoor pursuits is that it was a battlefield um so there is is if you go you find yourself at the vercor and i'm already thinking about doing a 10-day tour either next year or the year after where we include vercor on it a bus tour for those who are interested it shows you there the village how it talks about i'll, pre, I'll freeze frame it there it says the 178 civilian victims in the in the village there, and the planners, uh, planner, that's the French for gliders, are landed in the south of the village there. And it's a very good explanation there. It shows you where the passes are. The, the, from this is the, the ones the Germans didn't use. This is to the west. It shows you there's the terrain of the of the uh, the, the landing strip they were building, and it gives you all the um, the, the the geographical information um, with a with a compass there as well. Um, yeah, and I mean, there were about 25 people doing the museum when I was there. Um, the museum itself, we spoke to the director, well, the directors, it gets about 30,000 visitors a year, which is about double that at the Montormel Memorial in Normandy. But considering the San Mariglis Airborne Museum gets about you know one million or something, it's it's not very well visited, um, comparatively speaking. Um, and I was trying to film this while also not getting in the way of other people are trying to take take their own shots and views and and and, and footage they're not 
much footage but photos so apologies for the swiftness but what a location and uh, the museum was built about the time of the memorial of Caen, that modern where there's lots of lighting and and darkness and and there's sort of a an ambience an atmosphere they're creating and the bookshop was in was really really good at least a hundred book, different books there lots of young adult books they were selling by around frank Ma mouse about the holocaust lots of graphic novels however just one book available in english and was a book on d-day it was all the, the pitkin or orep guides to d-day so even though i was eight hours plus drive the d-day beaches the one book i could have bought in english was about d-day um and we we spoke to the director. He said they, there aren't that many English speaking visitors who go there. That's the village of Bassia on Bacor, right in the middle there. And if you remember my video I did from the cemetery, so that's in. The, I'll just play the video a little, little bit on a bit. If I pause it right there, so right in the mid, lower middle there, um, that kind of white area, that is the the cemetery. I did the live stream from where I did have a signal. So it's down the valley of the museum in between. The, the where the gliders landed and the, the reconstructed village that's where the the graves are that i did the um did the live stream from um yeah what an incredible location um i mean it's you're the you're the footsteps of the alps essentially um and yeah just just absolutely beautiful it's a little bit hot for a pasty englishman like myself but but beautiful and you know i i didn't want to go to into too much detail about the battle in this video or indeed any of them i put a link in the description to the paddy ashdown book cruel victory uh that talks about how this connects with the other parts of the french campaign and this this is me you know panning around now to within the middle of this viewing area there is another little plaque i'm taking you over to now where well, it's kind of the beginning of the alps it's not quite the alps many it's kind of the the, the beginning of the Alps. The Alps are a bit further away from Grenoble. You can see Mont Blanc, so the, the famous French mountain. And so to the to the dead and to the martyrs, the pioneers of the Vercors. So that is the end of the video. I'll put it back on my screen just to kind of finish off there um, and and take any questions. So yes, yeah, it's, it's not kind of it's like the foothills before the Alps, but it's not quite the Alps. Um, so yeah, so I'll just show that map again. So. Um, that's the German operation, Operation Bettina. And you can see the the Vassia on the core is in the middle there. If you look at, if you see the, saw the other videos I did, so I did one in La Chapelle in, on the core. That's where the little square was, where some French were murdered. I also did one in Saint-Nazaire on Royan, which is not on the map, but Pont, Pont on Royan is. So kind of center up there above Saint-Jean. I follow the Royan River across. There's another place called Saint-Nazaire on Royan which I did another video about another massacre there. And over the course of the rest of July and early August, pretty much all these villages, um, Crest in the bottom left there was the, the village they, they used for the naming in, they named the village Crest in the third series of Wish Me Luck that I talked about in the video there. They talk about Crest there. D, there's a museum there to the resistance and the uh, and the, 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 ba the battles. There's another museum about the, the deportations and the battles in Grenoble. And there's another one, Lyon, which is off the map, about a, you know, a 45 minutes an hour drive north of Grenoble. But that's where the German operation uh, took place. Um, I have my glasses on so I could look at the map there. So there we are. I'm going to leave it at that because I didn't want this to be too long, but I'm going to do more of these World War II TV walkabouts, probably do some ones in Normandy. And the idea is every, anywhere I go, I can do some of these on locations. But in this particular case, uh, there was no connection at the memorial there. But again, just to kind of review that museum, it was incredibly well done. And I like how the, the French... Um, we're particularly talking about the the learning that can be done from it. There's a video you can sit and watch in the museum. It didn't have English subtitles, but obviously I can understand it uh, well enough. And it was about how they take children from Grenoble, from the villages around, the towns around, to these places. And they talk about the fact that there were families massacred. Sometimes the Germans would go to a farm where there was a husband and wife and a couple of kids and just, and just murder everybody or, de kill, or kill some of them and deport the others. And if you're taking a 10-year-old child, to a place that they are already familiar with from hiking holidays. And you tell them about the 10 year olds kids that were murdered there 79 years ago. It's a very, very important and moving way of explaining that history. So although they, of course, they, they talked about the suffering, they talked about the massacres, there was this uplifting aspect of, of the fact that the villages have been rebuilt. 
that there's interest there. And the memorialization of this battle happened in 1945. It was very early. We often in Normandy, the first monuments don't go up until sort of 15, 20 years after war. The first memorials were going up a year after this battle that took place. So in August, July and August 45, there were already commemoration cemeteries, uh, ceremonies. De Gaulle visited there a couple of times. And then, of course, you get Winter Olympics happening in that area in the decades that followed. So they were very aware that this stand by the resistance, this this um, effort they had done to, to liberate their own country was worth talking about. And so they 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 talk about the the battles, they talk about the massacres, but there's this positive um, aspect of, of of education coming out of it. And I thought it was very well done. It's just a pity that not enough people really go there. Um, and is there any reason why they use lead? I don't think there was any reason why they use lead. They just did for some reason. I'm gonna, I, while you reminded me, I'm going to find my photo of that uh, while I'm talking to you and upload it because uh, I, I I know I I know I did get it there. So let me. I'll keep on talking and um, and um, I'll find that in a second for you. Um, uh, but yeah, it, it was just. I think it's just a way of trying to to use some sort of different means of of. Of, of commemorating, commemorating. Um, so I'm just while I'm talking to you, I'm finding it. Um, but yeah, no, I, my my overall experience there was 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 really good. Here, here, just getting to the photo now. Just uploading it. It'll be there any second now. And um, there we go. This this is so each of the each of those little lead square the squares contained the little kind of lead. It may not have actually been real lead, but they referred to it as lead. Um, and they kind of folded up the names, they put them there, and that's inside the memorial there. But so I didn't take many photos inside the memorial because I didn't think it was appropriate. Um, and um, there we are. So uh, I'm going to leave it at that. Um, and people are saying about on Google Maps, you can drop in Street View uh, and see some of those areas around there. And, I, and if you want to have a look at the roads going in, take the road that comes in from the north, uh, comes in, I forget the name of the town there, but you go through these tunnels. And one of the approach roads is still closed off to the, uh, today because it, it was unsafe. And uh, it was closed off in 2016 or something. So you cannot get to some where some of the famous photos are taken of the resistance kind of on these switchback roads with these tunnels uh, firing there or aiming their rifles and Brennan guns. You can't get to that location there. But uh, I have to say, as someone who's lived in uh, Essex for most of my life and then normally for the rest of it, these switchback mountain passes, I felt it was like a kind of an extended, either the, the bit in Goldfinger where Sean Connery, uh, James Bond is, is following the, the car or or the Italian job, you know, that my my, my van was going to go <laughs> over the edge and then we'd have to move the gold over and blah, blah, blah. But So it was a bit hairy driving up there, but my God, it was it was worth um, worth going up there to see it. And I want to go back and I will be going back. So um, there we are. And Foxtrot Romeo is saying, he just realized he had driven past the Vercor uh, heading south from Grenoble. So you did. The, so above Grenoble to Lyon, you've got the Chartreuse Mountains. Then over to the east, further, you have the actual beginning of the Alps. And then the Vercor is like the foothills of the Alps. And it's, it's you know, the Grenoble is the, the city that is the kind of the gateway to the proper Alps. Anyway, from Grenoble, it's like three hours drive to Turin. It's four hours drive to Milan. It's about two hours drive, two and a half hours to Geneva. So it's, you know, you're right in the, in, in the, in the mountains there, but I'm going to stop now. Um, unless you've got any last questions for me, for me, I'm going to stop there. Um, any last things I want to say about the Vercor? I did have some footage I took in the village itself, but there's not much to see there because it was all reconstructed, probably not enough to do a show about. And there's another village called, another big, big V, that I didn't get to, which is sort of a, a martyred village, it's a bit like Orador Sir Glan. Um, it was just a bit too far to get to in this trip, and it was up another winding road, and we were running out of time and running out of things to do. But there was that was another village. Uh, I'm going to try and remember its name while I'm talking to you. Um but I, I will go back there again and do that another time. It's like when me and Colin and Matt and others went to the Arken uh, last November. We didn't do all we wanted to in the Hurtgen, but it just means you've got an excuse to go back and do it again. So that's what we did, uh, or we will do at some point. So, um, yeah, if you do it all in the first time, you, you can't do it a second time. So, um, yeah, I can't remember the name of this other village. It's, it's really annoying me. Um, uh, no, I can't remember it. it. Begins with V, but that I didn't get to. Um, 
there are many cafes and restaurants in the middle of the plateau. Uh, there's a couple, the, the, the couple of restaurants there, but they're kind of high end. We actually took sandwiches with us and stopped and had a picnic at the top of the parking lot before we went down to the museum, and um, which was um, good. I have an outside voice and an inside voice. I think it's probably just the microphone. Um, I don't know. I don't know. I, I definitely, I know, when I was doing some of the videos, the live streams, I was in a place where people were being, had been murdered. I was definitely doing a slightly restrained voice because you're standing in a place you don't want to be saying, oh, this is where people were shot. So I was trying to do a slightly loud, uh, quieter voice there. Um, but anyway, I'm going to leave it at that. So folks, uh, if you are new to World War II TV, uh, Please consider becoming a subscriber, consider becoming a patron, becoming a YouTube channel member to fund this so that I can keep on bringing you these videos because um, it's a lot of effort, a lot of time. And every time I'm all the time I'm spent doing this is time I'm not spending earning any proper money to, as a tour guide. I want to do this full time, but I'm not going to do a big plea for help. I'm just remind you, as always, you can help by being a patron or a channel member. But that's it. I'm going to leave it at that. There's no show tonight. Um, it's tomorrow night, so Matt Lamart is coming on to talk about the 37th Division. Dave Holland is coming on. That's a morning show in the UK because he's in Australia, talking about the Medal of Honor recipients on Guadalcanal, focusing on the Army ones rather than the Marine ones, although we will cover Bazalone, although we have covered that in a separate show. Um, and then we've got um, more content coming your way. Check the listings. There's lots of stuff coming in. But that's it. It's Paul with World War II TV saying enjoy the rest of your day. Cheers, everybody. Bye.